Um, good afternoon. I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk. And also, since my initial invitation for the uh, talk, I moved and now I'm at the University of New Mexico. I also want to thank my colleague, Dr. Brian Davis, for being an early supporter and adopter of this technique for the poor surgical candidates when I was down in El Paso. So, okay, so today I'm going to do a review of the non surgical options for the management of patients with acute cholecystitis give you an overview of the general concepts of what a EUS gallbladder drainage is, review the comparative performance of this procedure with other non-surgical techniques, and give you a current, a review of the current indications, contraindications, uh, efficacy, and adverse events of the procedure. These are my disclosures. So the classic treatment for acute cholecystitis has always been cholecystectomy, first open, now laparoscopic, and now I see a lot more robotic-assisted procedures. However, not all patients are candidates for surgery, and therefore sometimes we have to opt for the non-surgical options, which typically include the percutaneous transhepatic cholecystostomy tube or the endoscopic drainage via ERCP. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both. ERCP drainage is uh, an effective procedure. It has a technical success rate between 84 and 96 percent and a clinical success rate between 88 and 97. The caveat to these numbers is that this procedure is not done in every single center, and these numbers come from centers with high volume and large experience doing this procedure. Uh, the adverse events is pulled around uh, 6 percent uh, with this uh, specific drainage procedure. So what about PTC? PTC has been the preferred method over the years. It's easy, it's quick. Technical and clinical success rates are pretty good, and adverse event rates uh, range between four, uh, three to five percent. The main drawback of this procedure is the high rate of reinterventions that these procedures that these patients need, and this is an area where this is a specific outcome where endoscopic ultrasound gallbladder drainage is making uh, big progress uh, uh, in terms of draining these patients. So what is it? It's basically creating a cholecystogastric or cholecystoenteric fistula using a metal or a plastic stent. We currently think that the indications for this procedure include any patient with high surgical risk who has acute cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis, or symptomatic cholelithiasis. Contraindications include a wide separation of the gallbladder and uh, duodenum or the stomach because that's going to preclude breaching it when you do the procedure, a contracted gallbladder because then you don't see the lumen and there's no space for you to deploy the stent, ascites, which is a relative contraindication. Sometimes people get a paracentesis and then subsequently get a procedure done. Large uh, stones, because large stones are going to obstruct the lumen of the gallbladder and you're not going to have enough space to deploy the stent. And also, Porcelain gallbladder patients are going to create a problem because the calcium in the gallbladder creates a lot of artifact on, on EUS and you're not really able to see it well. The technical aspects of the procedure are basically you always want to get a baseline CT or MRI of the abdomen of the contrast to get an idea of what the uh, relation of the position of the gallbladder to the duodenum or the, or the stomach is and also to assess the nearby structures. Ideally, you want to have a multidisciplinary approach you may want to have gastroenterology, IR, surgery, and medicine all involved working together. It requires a combination of radiologic, endoscopic, and sonographic skills, and therefore the endoscopist should be comfortable with all of these. Typically, we put the echoendoscope in the duodenal bulb or in the prepyloric area. We tend to prefer the duodenal location because there is less uh, migration rates compared to when we drain it from the stomach. However, you have to be aware that when we put the echoendoscope in that position and we need to torque the, the scope uh, more than we normally do, we may be able to find kidney cysts. And those right kidney cysts can look like gallbladders. So you have to make sure that you don't puncture a cyst before, uh, accidentally when you're trying to do this procedure. There's two basic techniques. The freehand technique, where you basically puncture the gallbladder directly with a cautery-assisted deployment device that these lumen opposing metal stents come with nowadays. It is the preferred technique. It minimizes the risk of complications because you're minimizing the uh, exchange of uh, devices over a wire. 
However, there's the other technique, that the classic technique, I would say, where it's just over the wire. In this technique, you puncture the gallbladder with a needle, get the wire inside, and then you exchange the needle and put the stent over the wire. Again, the more you exchange devices when you're doing this procedure, the higher your risk of, com of complications. This technique is, is good, however, in, in cases where you have to irrigate the gallbladder with water so that you can get a better view of the lumen, and I'm gonna show you a video of that. So I wanna to talk to you basically about the data of EUS gallbladder drainage with lumen opposing metal stents because that's basically what everyone in the uh, interventional endoscopy world is doing nowadays. There is data with plastic stents or self-expandable metal stents, but we're technically really moving away from those techniques. The procedure has a technical success rate between 95 and 97 percent, clinical success rate between 90 and 95, an adverse event rate pull of about 10 percent, and this is a work in progress. I'm sure the more and more publications keep coming out, the rate, the rate of adverse events is going to go lower. And like I said before, in the interventional endoscopy world right now, everyone prefers to use luminoposin metal stents. This is just a summary of the studies that have been, some of the studies that have been published using uh, these stents, and you see the red square is basically what I summarized for you in the previous slide. So this is a short video. Uh, this is a patient with acute cholecystitis. This is the gallbladder. This is where we're entering the gallbladder directly with a cautery-assisted device. We're gonna deploy the stent. The stents have two flanges, they look like dumbbells, so that they oppose the structures together. Here we're deploying the first flange internally in the gallbladder, and then the next one is gonna come up, and this is what it looks like from the dude in the wall. And you can see the bile flowing immediately after the procedure. Um, okay. The beauty of these stents is that they not only allow you to drain the gallbladder, but you can also intervene on stones. This is a patient that had a large gallbladder stone that got impacted in the stent after we drained it. And we're basically performing a laser lithotripsy to break the stone up so that we can clear the gallbladder again. And this is a very large stone. The diameter of these stents is about 15 millimeters. So it's probably about a two centimeter stone. We break it up, these are the pieces, and then we remove basically all the fragments with endoscopic devices. And this is what the gallbladder looks like after we clear the stone. We can basically go inside the gallbladder lumen and verify there is nothing left there. And after the procedure is done, we can safely remove the stents. This is an area where, it, and there is a gray area still, some people believe the stents should stay there forever. Some people believe that if the patient is healthy enough, we should remove them. I personally believe that we can remove them, but there's gonna have to be data coming out of this. This is basically how the stent looks like. You're gonna see it come out right now. And this is what the fistula looks like in about three to four weeks, this fistula is healed. This is the case where I was talking to you about before a large gallbladder stone in the lumen. There's really no much space for you to deploy the stent. This patient had previously underwent a percutaneous cholecystostomy drainage. So that worked out to our advantage because as you will see here, all you see is the stone. There's really nothing, no space for us to do anything, very little space. So we used the, the tube to irrigate the gallbladder with uh, water and you can see it opening up there. And that creates a better space for us to actually perform the drainage. Once the gallbladder was irrigated, we went in with the same technique that I was showing you earlier. And this is what it looks like when we're done. It's a pretty quick, safe procedure, and I'm gonna show you some of the literature supporting it right now. So what's the evidence between this and PTC? This is, there are multiple studies on this, by the way, but I'm just gonna talk to you about this one. It was a randomized multi-center study in high volume centers. All patients had acute cholecystitis and they were all high surgical risk patients, meaning greater than 80 years old, ASA above three, Charleston index above five. 
There were 80 patients, 39 in the EUS group, 40 in the PTC group. And um, the primary aim of the study was the rate of adverse events at one year. And these were all the secondary aims that the study evaluated. And basically, the EUS gallbladder procedure um, surpassed PTC in pretty much all the outcomes. Adverse events at one year, adverse events in 30 days, re-interventions, which is what I was telling you about in, the, in my previous slide, readmission rate, patients experience less pain with the EUS procedure than with the percutaneous one. The only two outcomes that were not different were the technical and the clinical success rates and the 30-day mortality. Therefore, the conclusion of the study was EUS gallbladder is superior to PTC and should be the procedure of choice. Subsequent to this, there's been multiple studies basically showing the same thing. A question that um, surgeons always ask us about this is, does it interfere with surgery? And it's a very valid question. There is a growing amount of data coming up on this uh, um, topic. This one was a multi-center study of patients who underwent EUS drainage with LAMS. LAMS is the acronym for lumen opposing metal stent, or PTC, and then underwent colis subsequent cholecystectomy. Primary outcome was a technical success rate of cholecystectomy, despite the presence of the fistulas, either duodenal or percutaneous, percutaneous, sorry, and secondary outcomes were the need for conversion to open cholecystectomy and periprocedural adverse events. Small study, 13 patients in the EUS group, 21 in the PTC group. All patients had a technically successful cholecystectomy. There was no difference between the rates of open versus laparoscopic cholecystectomy or post-surgical adverse events. Therefore, the conclusion was cholecystectomy is after U.S. gallbladder drainage is safe and feasible in patients whose underlying medical conditions improve after the drainage. This was another retrospective study comparing all three techniques, EUS, PTC, ERCP drainage. This was a retrospective multicenter study of patients with cholecystitis who underwent one of three modalities. The outcomes were technical success rate, clinical success rate, and adverse event rate. 372 patients. 146 in the PTC group, 124 in the ERCP group, 102 in the EUS group. The results of the study basically show that technical and clinical success rates were higher in the PTC and the EUS group compared to ERCP. And this goes back to what I was telling you earlier, ERCP gallbladder drainage is technically challenging and not uh, every center has the ability to do it. PTC had a higher number of complications. You can see here the numbers are this is statistically significant. There was the mean length of stay in the patients that underwent the EUS procedure was significantly shorter compared to the other two methods. And there were additional surgical interventions that were required in patients with the PTC group. And these were all uh, statistically significant outcomes. Therefore, the conclusion was EUS gallbladder drainage is effective and safer uh, alternative to ERCP or and PTC for treatment of patients with acute cholecystitis with high surgical risk. And then the last, and I guess the holy grail question at this point is, is it better than cholecystectomy? This was a retrospective study done by uh, Anthony Teo, which is the, the person who has basically pioneered this technique, has published extensively <coughs> on this procedure. This was a retrospective uh, propensity score analysis of patients who underwent EUS drainage versus uh, lab coli. Patients were matched by age, sex, and Charlson score. The outcomes were 30-day adverse, event, uh, adverse events rate, mortality, recurrent cholecystitis, recurrent biliary events, re-interventions, and readmissions. There were 30 patients in each group. And the study basically showed that every single out, there was no difference in any of the outcomes. You can see here, none of them were statistically uh, different. Uh, and therefore, the conclusion of the study was outcomes are comparable with EUS gallbladder drainage uh, compared to cholecystectomy and sh could be an option for patients who are not interested in having a cholecystectomy. Therefore, my conclusions uh, for today are EUS gallbladder drainage is clinically superior to PTC and ERCP drainage in high-risk patients, has a pool adverse event rate of about 10%. Again. The more and more we do this procedure, the rate, that rate is going to go lower. It does not preclude surgery after we do it. 
uh, preliminary data shows that it is equivalent, at least equivalent to cholecystectomy. And luminoposter metal cells are the ones that we prefer to do this procedure nowadays. And this is just my personal opinion. It will shortly replace all the other non-surgical uh, interventions for gallbladder drainage because it, it has a good amount of data supporting it. And with that, I will conclude. And I will be happy to address questions in the discussion board.